real life. Okay, welcome everyone. I think people are still joining, but I, I believe we can start now. Welcome everyone to this amazing session that I'm very excited about. My name is Okori and I'm a communications consultant and a member of IABC. And I am excited to moderate this session. I, I have two amazing people with me today and I'll let them introduce themselves, Andras and Philip. And um, Andras, you can go first and just introduce yourself. Then I will you know, give the participants um, the objectives and house rules then we start this conversation today yes thank you Ikori, and and uh, greetings for all, all all who are attending the conference i'm andras stanislav um, i'm a hungarian so hence my strange name um, i'm based in hungary at the moment uh, but before the pandemic i lived both in hungary and in the united kingdom so i lived um, um, a life in both countries I'm a strategic communication consultant, uh, meaning that uh, I mainly uh, advise clients on reputation, stakeholder management, and focusing on all different topics uh, from sustainability to government relations, measurement, internal communications, and everything. I studied as a journalist, um, so uh, I have that background in media economics as well. Uh, but then I learned the strategic side of the communication uh, and not, the, not the, the daily practice. And then I joined the, the, the CIPR when I moved to the U United Kingdom. Uh, basically, not only because of, uh, of uh, I knew too much about the CIPR, but I just wanted to belong to a community. Uh, and it happened to be a great community because I'm the member for over seven years now, I guess. Uh, and now I'm the chair of the international group. So I'm the chair of CIPR International. Besides that, I'm the president of the Hungarian PR Association. I run a small consultancy called Vitalifon Digital and also a strategic communication consultancy called Persona. So that's basically my uh, background. And uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity and thanks for the invitation. Go back to Corey. Thank you, Andres. Philip? Oh, is it my turn? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Hi everyone. So uh, my name is Philippe Borremans. Again, a, a strange family name. Uh, that's typical Belgian for you. Uh, that used to be my uh, my country of origin, but uh, I had the immense pleasure of um, living uh, on your beautiful continent for several years and working uh, there as well uh, for several years. So so this is a, always a, a great opportunity to connect again with uh, with Africa and the uh, communication professionals. My background is public relations. That's what I've studied. Um, worked for IBM 10 years, uh, then uh, six years as a chief social media officer for an international group. And uh, apart from currently being the volunteer president for the International Public Relations Association, uh, during the normal daytime, uh, I work as a emergency uh, risk communication consultant uh, currently uh, on a 10-month mission uh, for the WHO uh, and uh, I mentioned I worked in West Africa again that was in the context of fighting epidemics and pandemics so that's uh, that's my specialty very happy to be here thank you thank you for that introduction so just to um, set the stage in terms of letting everyone know why we're here um, so the objective of this session or this panel really is to discuss the importance of PR and communications um, as a profession, how we put this on the map um, as a profession and um, an importance of ethics and PR associations. You've heard from our panelists, their background. So they're very, very important to this discussion today. And um, activities like, you know, awards and credentials that, you know, help to raise the profile of PR and communications in Africa. So um, I'm really happy that both of you are here and I'm really looking forward to, to the discussion today. So just to set the stage um, a little bit, I if 
I, I would ask both of you this question to start with. Um, when, when, so, when we talk about professionalizing PR and communication, what does this exactly mean? So everyone has a very good understanding and we're working on the same basis as we're having this conversation. Um, Philip, you can go first. Well, for me, professionalizing, it, it, it's different dimensions, right? It's uh, how do you keep the profession active and also as a professional, how do you keep being professional, meaning uh, continuous investment in training, education on different levels. Uh, but as president of IPRA, and, and I think our colleagues at the CIPR don't, don't think differently, it's also about looking at uh, making sure that uh, the people who consider themselves being part of our global family of public relations professionals or communicators uh, are up to standard um, and that we we do accept them in our family but there are a couple of things and you already mentioned one and i think it's a fundamental one that's our ethical code um, and so i think that's about um, the discussion i think that at least that's what, what comes to me, to my mind, when we talk about uh, the being a professional communicator or public relations professional. Andras, do you have something to add? Yeah, when I, when I just heard your, your question, I immediately wanted to re-question uh, something. Do we have a real definition of uh, whether public relations is a profession or industry or a practice? Uh, so I think that there is no like a global definition of what professionalism uh, means. To me, it's, it's, I think it's like four or five different uh, things. One, and probably uh, most important for me uh, personally, is the credibility and the authenticity. So without that, without, without, without the authenticity, a, a professional cannot be professional. Uh, so I think that's the first one. The, the second one is with what you mentioned, but also Philip mentioned as well, uh, is the ethical standards and the ethical behavior. Then um, I would say uh, the best use of tools and technologies uh, available. So I think that's, that's also part of the professionalism is that you know what are the tools out there. Philip has great experience because he has a <laughs> PR, PR tool uh, newsletter as well. So he's focusing on that as well, but the way you use it also is part of the professionalism. Um, and I think the next um, to me is the art of listening and understanding, because I think PR professionals uh, sometimes forget how important it is to understand our environment, our circumstances and all the stakeholders. So without that being in your focus, you're not professional at all. Um, and there is one more thing, which is kind of funny, but I think it's very important for me. Um, and it, it's, just, it, it's just something I've realized throughout the pandemic, like last 12, 14 months, is the right to fail. And to me, it's also very important for being a professional that if I do something wrong, that I can admit, I can, I can, I can tell all my stakeholders, even my colleagues, uh, my clients that I did some mistake, uh, be them technical, like your child is just running behind you during a, a, a conference call. Uh, but also if you do something if you, uh, uh, from detention from, uh, because of your mental health state, uh, you do something or you, you say something wrong to your audience, then you can say sorry. And I think that that, that is something we learned throughout the pandemic um, uh, 12, 14 months. But that's also a key part of, the, of, of being professional, I guess. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. And just based off, on, off of that, that answer from both of you, um, Andra, so why do you think it's important for us to um, improve this body of knowledge, um, kind of work on, an, on the ethical standards, and also certification of PR um, and communication professionals? Uh, honestly, I will have two answers, a professional one and a personal one. <laughs> uh, I think that the, the technology issue and, and the new knowledge is, is very key for professionalism. So the lifelong learning and in all different ways. So for example, CIPR has, I don't know, five or six ways of, of, um, uh, of le learning and training opportunities. One is the university courses. Uh, one is the training courses, which uh, I think four or five of them are accredited by CIPR, which are based in 
uh, in Africa. So they provide CIPR qualifications. So that, that, that's also uh, uh, part of the services we offer. There are trainings. Uh, and since the pandemic, all trainings are available online as well. So everyone from anywhere in the world uh, can join the trainings. The CPD, which is slightly unique uh, to, uh, to this profession, is the lifelong learning opportunity with basically, I think, thousands of great materials. Um, and also CIPR International, our group, has lots of free, uh, free stuff, free materials like uh, the webinars, uh, the recordings. So they are available uh, on demand as well. But uh, my, my personal answer to the certification is rather that I, I, I was not, never running after the certifications. So certification was never the aim for me. I got chartered just about a year ago last summer, but the aim was not to get the certificate. It's uh, the knowledge because I had to prepare myself. I've learned from others as well through the assessment days. The people I know, that's also very important. And, um, and basically the challenge for myself. So I think it's not just the knowledge what you are gaining from these lifelong learnings and, and, and following the ethical guidelines is that you learn from yourself. So you commit yourself to, some, to, to, to challenges and learn, some, learn something more. And, and honestly, CIPR has great resources to do that. Philip. What was your question again? Because we've, we've covered so many topics in there in the answer of Andres. That... So, so basically, I was saying why, why, why is it important now to you know improve you know body of knowledge around PR and communications, ethics, and also the certifications. Why? Yeah, for me, it's, it it also starts with a huge responsibility everyone has working in this field. I I think sometimes we underestimate the importance of our actions of what we do the impact that we have on 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 people on their decisions and if you're in in a more commercial sector then it's about the way that they buy or perceive a brand or whatever um, in my sector it's changing behaviors uh, so it's 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 a huge responsibility to be working in communications and public relations and if you have that responsibility and you want to do your job seriously, um, again, there is a code of ethics that you need to follow. There is training that you need to, just like any other serious profession, um, where you need to continuously update yourself, see what's happening, um, and invest in yourself, uh, and connect with other peers as well, because otherwise we tend to be in our little corner and do our thing. Um, and one other topic that um, for the last year uh, uh, and, and through IPRA, I've been hammering on that. Um, yes, we have um, <clears throat> creative tasks in our profession, uh, but communications is based on science. And um, that is something that I have a feeling that we've lost a little bit. Um, and I think we need to return to uh, building bridges with our academic colleagues again, because what we do, if we want to do it well, it's based on research, it's based on science. And yes, there is this creative part of what we do, which is fun to do. But if it's not based on science, on behavioral insights, on uh, what happens in society, um, in my job, it's even based on what my colleague who is an anthropologist tells me. Um, so that is an important fact. And, and I think if we, if we take these things together, an, a sound ethical foundation, investing in science and science-based insights, and then professional development, we have three big pillars I think we can work with. But to me personally, then that means it. And I, and I try to push that uh, as well with, with the board members of Eprime and with our with our colleagues across the globe. Yeah. Yes. Um. Thank you. Just to summarize, I, I think in the in the last twelve to fourteen months, um, we've also seen even with the pandemic how important um, PR and communication professionals are, um, even to sit in on the table, basically to make decisions um, that affect their organizations. So it's. I, I agree with you and just to summarize what both of you have spoken about um, that it's it's about the learning 
um, investing in yourself, making sure that you know you're up to date to do the work that you've been called to do, um, is um, also being able to focus on what drives the profession. Um, Philip, you mentioned the science of communications, and I totally agree that you know it should um, should also start thinking around um, a, a data driven culture. Um, wherever that data is coming from, basically for, for our profession and the ethics um, and the standards. And I, I really want both of you to talk more about this ethics. Um, it's, it's a very interesting conversation on, on its own. So thank you for that. And, and just to- um, uh, Sorry, Pui, just, just one thing to, to echo uh, what Philip has said is, I think the science has like uh, two dimensions. One is the science of our profession. Uh, so what we learn uh, uh, from, from other peers, what we learn from the trainers, the university courses, but also our relation as a profession to the science in terms of the climate change, in terms of, uh, of, of the vaccination and the misinformation, because that has the huge responsibility. If our, and that, that, that leads back to my, my original point one is the credibility or authenticity. If we are just doing communication for its own sake and not for the better, and not for the good, uh, then we're just missing the point, we're missing the mission of, of our profession. So I think that, that, that it's also very key to, to uh, everything we do should be based on fact and the aim should definitely not to uh, mislead or, or provide misinformation or disinformation. And that, that, that's where science comes in in a different form. Hmm. Thank you for adding that, thanks for adding so I just wanted to bring it back to a more practical you know, conversation. How has, it, how has this been done in different countries? Both of you are um, lead um, professional associations and you know, what are the benefits um, you've seen you know, these associations have um, had on, on communications professionals and how have they supported this legitimacy um, of this profession? basically. Andras, you can go first. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it, it's, it's not a game, or it should not be a game <laughs> of who's going first. But uh, <laughs> my, I think my biggest take would be on accountability. So I think probably one of the, the biggest benefits I, I had throughout being a member of different uh, uh, associations and also leaders in a, in a way in different associations is the accountability. Um, is that you sign for uh, the code of conduct. Uh, and the code of conduct doesn't just mean that when you join the association is that you sign that you abide to, uh, but also there are processes that if there is an ethical uh, misconduct or eti unethical behavior, uh, then there is a process how you can be fined, how you can be expelled from, um, uh, from this association. And that has a power as well. Uh, but also, you know, like more practical stuff than that uh, you are registered uh, so everyone can find you. you the, that means that you belong to a community. Uh, with the CIPR, there are two more levels. They're accredited and the chartered uh, status, which is an obvious benefit. And it's probably, as far as I know, that's the only one over the globe. Uh, what CIPR can provide the accredited and the chartered sta status. So that's, that's also a benefit besides all the, you know, training opportunities and learning opportunities and the networking opportunities as well. Thank you, Philip. Do you have anything to add? No, I, I think uh, what, what is important is that we take up our role as, as associations and um, we all have a bit our, our not our specialty, but our, our first of all, where, where we started out and what the scope was. Um, I think it's, it's incredibly powerful that the associations, first of all, work together. I think we've a bit passed and Andras, again, tell me if I'm wrong because I'm, I'm pretty new to the presidency, but uh, I, I I'm still a member of the EACD, which is a European focused association and then IPRA's president. But um, I think we've, we've seen that we can easily work together, open doors, build bridges, because at the end of the day, that's where we are. What we do as professionals is building bridges and opening doors and bringing people in contact. And to me, that is the, the, the biggest role of associations that if you're part of an association, um, that you're part of a group of professionals 
Um, and that is so important today because, uh, first of all, you could be working in your very small geographical area, but you know that you know, other colleagues are just a call away or an email away or a visit to the integrated social platform away. Um, but it, it is so powerful. I mean, having worked in countries like Liberia, Sierra Leone, um, and, and, and just uh, a big hat off and enormous respect uh, for the uh, public communicators there uh, previously with other epidemics and now with the pandemic. I know what the resources are there on the ground. I see how they face pandemics and epidemics like we do here maybe in Europe, uh, but they do that with a minimum of resources and sometimes really only lifeline. They can call, they can ask for resources, be it a template, be it a connection, be it uh, a tool, be whatever, because they are part of a bigger association. I think that's the power of associations uh, that we have this, next to the fact what Andrew said, um, that you have an ethical code, there's procedures in place, and we can at least tell those colleagues who do not follow the code, you know, that this is not correct, that we can expel them, and that we can point them out to the general public, because that is a function which is important. Uh, and personally, I think we need to do that more. There's a lot of work to be done on that scale. Um, but, but that is definitely important. And the role of associations, again, for me, is bringing professionals together. Uh, it's incredibly powerful when what you are doing now, I mean, you're bringing so many people together from the African continent and outside of the African continent, uh, because that is, that is your role. And that's what you've put up as, as an objective. CIPR is doing that with events and training and, and summits. IPRA is running monthly free webinars for, for our international members and for non-members, because it's about connecting people. Imagine that there wouldn't be associations and we have to figure that out all out by ourselves. I think that's the main power of associations. Yeah. Um, uh, and also, also let me add a couple of thoughts because uh, I'm wearing uh, different hats because I'm uh, not just uh, the chair of CIPR International, as said, but the president of the Hungarian PR Association. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the whole context from a different angle from a very small uh, and tiny associations where we have members, both individuals, uh, agencies, and, and uh, corporate uh, in-house teams as well. Uh, and what Philip has said was one of the main reasons when, why we had partnerships and signed partnerships with IPRA, for example, to five, six years ago, and the CIPR is to learn from each other. And uh, there are two big global associations which are um, uh, connecting local national associations. One is the Global Alliance and, when, and the other one is the Eco, more for agency people. Um, and their aim is to support the local, uh, local associations with knowledge, with network, with, uh, with content, lots of content, and also with very practical information. So one of the reasons why we wanted to join international associations uh, is because we wanted to learn how other, uh, others are doing. And four, four or five years ago, I was attending um, the uh, Ugandan PR Association Prowse AGM on behalf of the CIPR. And it was a great lesson for me because you know, we have members from all over, uh, all over, I mean, CIPR has, uh, CIPR International has members from all over Africa, I think from like 10, 15 countries. Uh, and I wouldn't be able to serve those members. I wouldn't be able to support those members if I, if I, if I don't know them, if I, uh, if I'm not meeting them, if I'm not uh, inviting them to sp uh, as speakers, hence our collaboration with Africa Communication Week, and we had already done four or five uh, webinars which are available on demand as well. One of them was with, with Philip a couple of weeks ago uh, on crisis communication. So uh, again, the learning from each other and the networking is also a very key part of, of these associations. I, I totally agree. And I'm just here nodding my head because my big introduction to associations was last last year, um, apart from being a member of Africa Communications Week, um, I accessed resources from the International Association of Business Communicators while working on crisis comms for COVID-19. And I think that was what really spurred me into rethinking my um, contributions and 
you know, wanting to be part of an association. And it's been amazing since then. Um, the networking um, kind of putting me on, on my toes in terms of what I know and what I need to learn. And, but I, I agree with Philip, the, the big thing is that, and this is a question I want to throw out in terms of accountability. So we see a lot of um, associations for different professions or, you know, kind of regulatory, um, you know, the regulatory functions that they play. Where do you think we are in, in terms of, you know, the PR and communications profession? Because Philip, you're saying, you know, if a member doesn't um, abide by a code of um, ethics or code of conduct, you know, there are repercussions, but how, how is that really enforced? Because we're thinking about, you know, making this very professional, right? And saying that we're, you know, people would look at our profession and hold them to the, the utmost standard um, in terms of practice. So what are the challenges? What are the gaps here? And in turn, in terms of, I like to think about the challenges and the gaps, but the opportunities we have moving forward. Yeah, can I just, you mentioned that you were accessing resources um, as a professional during uh, the pandemic. Um, I think it's a, a, a very strong example of what, when associations come together, what we can do. I mean, we, we automatically um, connected uh, CIPR, um, IPRA, many other associations, PRSA, when this came up, this pandemic. And we said, look, volunteers, who's a volunteer to give? And these are senior consultants like, you know, Andres and myself and others who normally invoice by the hour or by the day at least uh, who wants to volunteer and and you know give away these hours of consulting pro deo for any other colleague who has an issue and is fighting for information and fighting this thing i mean that was done in what in a week and boom it was there and we've delivered i don't know how many hours of you know free consulting to colleagues who had were in need so that is very powerful and i think and as you mentioned um, well, you said climate change. I, I take the, the guardian principle on there. Uh, I call it climate crisis as from today or from a couple of months ago when the guardian decided not to call it change, but crisis. Um, imagine what we can do together if we, we sit around the table and there are initiatives around that. Uh, imagine what we can do for other uh, societal issues if we can do that. And we should be doing that. Now on your uh, question then, um, that it's it's as you said it's uh, there are gaps but there are opportunities uh, to give you an ID uh, you don't need well you need if you want to move to the next step which is uh, telling people that they're not following uh, the ethical code and then what would follow as maybe expulsion or what have you but I'm in a, in a in a Facebook group with a couple of uh, communication professionals and, and we are all member of different associations. It's not association run, it's simply we know each other and we connect on Facebook. And we had a whole discussion a couple of days ago where simply by one of the colleagues pointing out something which was totally unethical, run by a small PR agency in the UK, had a full discussion going on and where in fact we, we decided what we potentially could do. And because in the UK and because maybe some memberships, we could point that out to the board of that association and say, your member is definitely not following in any kind of ethical code. What are you going to do about it? So there's this professional, let's say social system in place where those who follow the ethics can point out others and say, can you please look at it? And then I'll turn to Andres because they've got a strong procedure behind you know, having these ethical things, because every time we talk about ethics, I mean, we, we, we do turn uh, to CIPR and, and, and the procedures they have in place, because it's very well done. And also because there were a couple of, let's face it, high, high profile cases over the last years, but uh, and not and I'm not saying from members, but in the UK, I mean, so, um, but it is, as you said, it is an opportunity as well, because it does elevate the standard um, and, and without that, um, 
you know, it's it's very difficult to be perceived as very professional if you have a couple of what I call cowboys running around and, and doing communications as they think they, they can do. Yeah, uh, let me just reflect on, on, uh, on, on the ethical part and then I'll bring uh, one additional thought to this. Uh, on the ethical part with regards to CIPR, um, there are two very great examples. One is that um, uh, if you want, I mean, you can, you can have, you can uh, 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 reach two status uh, within the CIPR and that's unique for CIPR. One is the accredited status. When you do CPDs, uh, which is a 12 month period and you, you collect 60 points uh, for what you do for, for, uh, for your professional learning and life, lifelong learning. Then after two years of completing the two consecutive years of completing the CPDs, you will automatically become accredited. But part of the CPD mandatory scores, there is an ethical element. So if you don't do an ethical training, reading an article, uh, 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 listening to a conversation, then you won't get your CPD uh, score accredited. So that's, that's, that's a very important one. The, its next level is uh, after three consecutive years of, of being accredited practitioners, you can uh, go for the chartership assessment and the chartership assessment has like three main pillars, the leadership, the strategy and the ethics. And to me, because I, I, I've done it last year, to me, the best experience was not that it was an exam, but it was a conversation. And the preparation was the longest part of, of, um, uh, of, of the assessment. It's a one day, it's a one full day program, but um, I need to prepare for months to just reflect on my experiences, what I've done good, what I've done uh, wrong and how I will change my profession. And throughout the assessment day, we had conversations and we talked to each other and we shared experiences. So that's with regards to that part. And the additional one, uh, which is kind of like the gaps uh, which you mentioned uh, is I think that PR, PR professionals tends to say, and it's probably an ongoing uh, issue that we say that the reputation of our profession is always very bad. And I think that um, two like main issues happened last year, the climate change as it turned to climate crisis, according to Philip. Uh, so that's one thing. And, and um, uh, probably the pandemic was, was, was a big influence, uh, has a big influence on that, is that for ages, for decades, we PR professionals had to make the board understand the importance of the two-way communication, understanding our stakeholders, managing all different uh, stakeholders, while because of the pandemic, everyone has, you know, everyone turned into the crisis situation immediately. Uh, then all leaders, corporate leaders had to learn that this is part of their operation. This is not an additional stuff. This is part of their operation. And I think that that was, that was a great help for PR professionals that the corporate leaders understood the importance and also the responsibility of our profession. And I think the role of the PR associations and PR organizations is to emphasize this importance, is to emphasize this responsibility of our profession. And that's something we can work on. I mean, we are in a good, good position, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, thank you for mentioning that. And um, it's, it's also um, a realization that there is a really big opportunity to continue to raise that profile um, of the profession at this point in time where, you know, everybody is realizing the importance um, of the profession in this, in this time. So are there, are there any um, last words, Andres and Philip? Um, before we go into Q and A from the audience, well, Corey, what what you said is um, th there is definitely an opportunity, and I completely agree. I've seen, I've never seen the attention or the importance of communications so high on the agenda. Uh, I'm very happy, by the way, for our internal communications colleagues who now <laughs> are on top of the agenda, which is a good thing because poor poor colleagues, um, but. Uh, there are enormous challenges as well. I mean, we need to accept as well that we are one of the uh, professions industry which have been very, very, very slow in first understanding and then adopting uh, internet and technology. I mean, 
some of our colleagues still don't understand how things are working. We are very slow. If you compare us to our marketing cousins, we are way behind. We need to acknowledge that. We need to invest in that. We need to start understanding what is happening. Um, to come back to my previous point, if we do not pretty urgently learn from our science colleagues, our academic colleagues, what we've done wrong during this pandemic, and the cases are known, it, it wasn't all very well organized from a communications point of view, and that's even an understatement, then again, we will not achieve that position that we all crave. Um, and, and then there's a third one, which I think is, is, is crucial. Um, and I know Andres, I mean, we're aligned on this because otherwise we wouldn't be a member of the associations we're a member of. But I just sat on a jury of uh, an award scheme and, and you, you were mentioning awards. Half of those case studies still had AVEs in there, add, add value equivalent. If, I mean, if that doesn't change, and we've been talking about this, you know, to end these things for years and years, but if it doesn't happen this year, I don't know where we're going to get. Because if you go to a senior business manager and you come with that kind of metric, not really, you don't get any credibility. And so to me, those three points and, and some others, but those are really crucial. If we don't change that together as associations, as professionals, we're going to lose that opportunity that we, we've been given. Indeed, I, I would echo to that. Yes, obviously. Uh, and I also would emphasize the importance of technology for, for um, one of the reasons is what Philip has mentioned, but the, but the other reason why, where, uh, which is where, uh, why we, or where we started our conversation is the responsibility that we're using, the, we're using these tools. So um, I think that, you know, our profession is basically to drive conversations between all stakeholders, uh, but with those tools, if you use them in a wrong way, then uh, we could manipulate as well. And that's also an important part uh, of our professionalism is how ethical we, we use this technology because we have to fight, fight against misinformation, the disinformation, uh, and also the ethical challenges of, of, of using the technology, for example, the deep fakes. Uh, if we use technology well, quite well, then we can make big, big mistakes, uh, not only because of our credibility, but because we, we can turn conversations, we can turn the stories, we can turn the narratives of products, of thoughts, of ideas, governments, uh, healthcare systems uh, into a very, very uh, bad direction. So uh, I would encourage ourselves to, to collaborate on this uh, because a, the, the, the need of the technology knowledge is key, but the, the second one is as important to use the technology in an ethical way. Thank you, Andras and Philip, for you know, those interesting thoughts. Um, and it's, it's also making me to think quite, quite a bit. Um, but Philip, I wanted to probe just a little bit. You know, you, you quickly rushed talking about PR awards um, and I wanted you to give a, a little bit more context. Are you saying, you know, it should be changed in terms of structure or is it that it's not adding the value that it should add to the profession or to the association? I would like to be clearer on that. Sorry, no, no, not at all. The awards are crucial as long as we have the systems in place which are aligned. And I was making a point about measurement and evaluation metrics. We have now globally accepted uh, measurement and evaluation metrics that we know we can use, which are scientifically sound. And we should all agree on those. I mean, we are agreed on those, but still I saw organizations, you know, in their case study using these vanity metrics, which don't mean anything at all if, if you don't, anyway. But that is an issue that we need to work on. But the, the concept of awards is crucial because we need case studies. It's only by having case studies in a certain format, a form and format, that we can use these 
to compare, to learn, to use as case studies what they're supposed to be. It's not just getting the award, which is fine, and that's recognition, and that is important. But it's also getting the input of, of campaigns that worked. Why did they work? How were they measured? What were the tactics? Um, and it's learning from those case studies. With, and that's why an award is very important. So don't get me wrong. Awards are very important. Um, but uh, in fact, my, my link to the awards and the measurement and evaluation part was about the question, you know, we have an opportunity, but only if we really shoot down wrong metrics, those vanity metrics that really don't serve anyone. Thank yeah, you. Let me just share a fun, fun example. Uh, uh, well, actually, it's a sad one, but uh, it looked funny because um, I, I, I usually uh, jury, uh, I'm on a jury with several like local and international uh, award schemes as well uh, because of my experience. And uh, two years ago, when I became the president of the Hungarian PR Association, that was one of the first statements I made that every uh, award scheme we introduce or we continue, we will ban AVEs. Yeah. So all, uh, all submissions or, or entries having AVEs as a metric is we automatically ban. Now, uh, that was, that was a big achievement that we not only uh, did that achieve that with our uh, prize award schemes, uh, but also with the professionals one in, in Hungary. So every, uh, uh, every um, award scheme, which is based in Hungary and has anything to do with uh, the, the, um, the PR industry uh, are banning AVEs. So that's a huge ach achievement. Why the funny part is that I was uh, on a jury of an international award uh, for an association which is related to the ones who uh, we get this ban from, uh, this, this banning idea, and there were tons of, uh, tons of entries with, uh, with AVEs mentioned. So I was in a, a kind of challenging situation, what to do then? <laughs> who, who is walking the talk? Um, but, the, but the other thing is that, uh, and we try it with, with our new award scheme, is that we are not only expecting um, um, PR campaigns in a way that these funny, uh, very emotional, very kind of PR stunts, but we wanted to, where well, we created a new category for PR strategies. And those are not, you know, the vanity campaigns. Those are the ones we could have a very strong metrics against business goals. Uh, and I think that's part of the association. Uh, obviously, we are not expecting too many entries uh, because that's not very popular and you cannot really talk about it. But that's part of our mission as a professional association uh, to do that. And the other thing with award schemes, uh, is what Philip has mentioned, is that we can learn from that. So professional associations should not just do awards for the revenues, uh, for you know, setting a revenue stream. It really should focus on spreading the news of the good practices, spreading the news of the good, good campaigns uh, and you know, drive conversations around them because it's very, very important. And you can learn a lot from different cultures, from different approaches, from different usage of technology. Uh, so that's absolutely valid for the African continent as well. I've seen very, very good campaigns throughout Africa, uh, which could be implemented. I mean, the approach, the idea can be implemented in other countries. We can learn from that as well. And also international award schemes. CIPR has introduced a global category for, uh, for the excellence award. Uh, just for, its, I mean, th that was the aim for that. Thank you. Um, thanks for exploring the... No, no, no. It's really good and interesting. It's a very interesting conversation and very enlightening. And I'm sure the um, attendees feel the same way. But I'm going to move um, in the next um, 10 minutes to just focus on Q&A. Um, and I would ask the attendees to, to ask their questions in the Q&A box. Um, and we will take them and answer the ones we can answer in that time live. So I have um, a question here from Eva, and it says one of the areas which interests me particularly is that in the CIPR charter, Andres, I think this is for you, we must act in the public good. Could the panelists explore this a little? Is it always essential? Is it always possible? Should we say no to some clients? Or as in the law, does everyone deserve defense? So 
I'll give that to you, Andres. Yeah, that's a really challenging question. And I know Eva would have asked these questions because she was a, she's the past president of CIPR International and she's my mentor. Uh, and my answer would be for that. Uh, and I'm sure that he didn't, uh, she didn't ask this for, uh, for promotion, but we organized a webinar on this, <laughs> this very topic. So if anyone's interested, then you can search for the, uh, on YouTube, uh, our CIPR Chartered Institute of Public Relations channel, and we have a playlist for international context. And, and we did just the same, uh, because I think it's a very important, um, uh, like professional challenge. Uh, it's, uh, to me, it's always the three questions. Who do you work for? What do you work? And how do you work? Um, uh, so would you work for a government which is you know, undemocratic in any way? Uh, that's at equal challenge one. Then would you work for those, for, for those governments or for, the, for that client uh, if the work is something which is, which is good for the nature, which is good for the society, which is good for the climate crisis? Uh, would you work for that? I mean, uh, can, can you um, make a difference whether who you work for and what do you work? And, and third, but, uh, but as important, is how do you work? Do you do the work uh, using uh, you know, unethical tactics or challenges or to, uh, uh, channels or tools uh, in any way? So I think that uh, my answer would, would, would be around like three different layers. One is your personal layer. And there are organizations, for example, uh, we, we invited uh, Tony Langham from Lensons. Uh, they have the right, their colleagues have the right to, re to refuse to work for a client. That's a very high ethical standard. That's on a personal level. Then the second level is, is to abide with, with professional conduct, uh, code of conduct. So if you're a member of an association, then you, ha you have to follow uh, the professional guidelines. And third is probably a most um, uh, soft answer for, for me, but it's, because it's based on conversations. So I think that ethics, uh, the ethical challenges are changing all the time. And we as professionals, need to talk about them all the time. As members of the associations, uh, as professionals on Facebook groups like Philip did with, uh, with peers and friends. Uh, so that's part of our roles because we learn from each other. We learn the different uh, uh, challenges. One good example, we wanted to cover Africa and the African continent uh, with CIPR International. And first we invited Robin de Villiers from South Africa, from BCW. Uh, to the House of Lords, to one of our events, to talk about the different ethics, the different approaches to ethics, uh, because we wanted, I mean, in the UK, we wanted to understand how, what, what is going on and how is it going uh, in Africa. So that's part of the conversation which we're having. I think it's, um, this is something that will be debated for the next, you know, centuries, because, I mean, ethics and then I like the question about, you know, the first of all, the common good. And then um, it also said, does everyone deserve defense? <sighs> Do you, can you, okay, if you subscribe to a, an association, which in its charter says that uh, communications should be done for the common good, can you work for the uh, fossil fuel industry. Personally, I don't think so. But again, what do you do? How far can you go in those things? I used, when I started out in public relations, I started with Porto Novelli. And it was a, at the time a small agency in, well, it's an international agency, but the, the office in Brussels was very small. And uh, right from the start, it grew from seven people to 45 people um, in three years time. And uh, right from the start, as a consultant, you always had the choice to refuse to work for a client. And we had cases and I also refused to work for a certain client. And in my team, I had an associate who, re who reported to me who refused to work for one of my clients. And you respect that. But then there's a higher level. Um, who do you take on as a client, for instance, as a solo consultant? I would, you know, any kind of fossil fuel company I don't work for by definition, because I don't think it's aligned with the climate crisis that we have now. Um, 
do they have the right to uh, be defended? Sure, as long as it follows ethical guidelines, it's based on transparent information uh, and not manipulation, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's not black and white, these discussions. You always have to go and look. And I would be the first ones to say they are, they, they are entitled to defense from a public relations professional, definitely. It's fundamental, but needs to be based on our ethical codes that we agreed upon not on manipulation, not on framing, not on... So it, it is a difficult discussion. It's also, I think, a discussion that as associations, we really need to have together on a continuous basis because these will change. They're pretty, some cases are black and white, I mean. But others are not as simple as saying, oh, you're wrong, you're right. Uh, that's not what ethics are about. It's not saying you're wrong, you're right. It's about having discussions and seeing where you go, taking a common basis that all agree upon. And that's always difficult. Thank you for those um, answers to Eva's questions. Um, are there any other questions from the attendees? Because I can't see any. <laughs> yeah, maybe they are in the chat room. No, none. I'm also okay. monitoring the okay. chat. I mean, there are some comments, um, Andras and Philip, I would say you should um, go through in the Q&A and, um, okay, I've gotten a question from Ella <laughs> um, to Philip. The net zero will be most mostly driven by the large energy companies, that's the multinationals. The research and innovation required by the energy transition are enormous in terms of the financial aid and technical requirements. Um, today, without the fossil fuels industry, we wouldn't use Zoom, we wouldn't have ambulance and wouldn't have ventilators. Ella, can you let us know um, what the question is or is this more of a comment? Sounds more like a comment. Okay. Yeah, to me, it was more like a challenge for, uh, for Philip saying that he, he wouldn't work for a fossil fuel company. Uh, but I have a... You're muted. Philip, you're muted. Philip, Philip, you're muted. Oh. He's probably just saying the best words throughout the conference when we just couldn't hear. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I, want, I would... I would gladly take on that challenge because it's it's it is of course you can come up with the natural facts of course we wouldn't have a zoom thing with with you know with fossil fuel i'm talking about the ethical way of knowing for 30 years that there is an issue with what you're doing as a core business and not talking about it and it's still today framing that discourse in a totally different way that's what i was mentioning uh, of course we have to live with legacy systems that's how history works but it's about what we do today and what has been going on for the last 30 days within that industry that is not really ethical to me. Um, so I don't know if that was an answer, but we can have a full debate on that, of course. Yeah, I have a very great example, but I'll be very short because uh, I know we're running out of time. Uh, that, that's the challenge of, of, of the three layers, uh, which I mentioned. Uh, I was invited to work for an oil company, a big oil company in Central Eastern Europe. Okay, would you work for that or not? Okay, my, my, my answer was at that time, 12 years ago, that yes, let's see what the work was. The work was about renewables, renewables, renewable energy. So just as Menti, uh, Ella mentioned, uh, it was about helping them into the right direction. So the, the second answer was okay, obviously, this is a good topic, uh, we could work on that. But then we ended up uh, coming up with a strategy with very good arguments and uh, at one point, one of the consultants, uh, internal consultants, asked me to do uh, third party communication, meaning astroturfing, creating NGOs for spreading uh, the information, uh, which is uh, beneficial for the company. Now that's the third layer. I wouldn't do that. So the first, who do you work for? What do you work for? And how do you work for? So oh, you have all these ethical challenges. And my short answer for, for Ella is definitely yes. So we. Uh, we need to help them going to a, a right direction. Thank you, um, Andras and Philip, for this wonderful conversation. I really learned a lot and I'm really 
have taken away um, a couple of things about um, the opportunities um, PR and communications profession has, um, whether it's in learning from the science um, and understanding the science and using data. Um, Andres, I, I love the way that you brought in the ethical use of technology, because even though everything is advancing, there's a lot of misinformation and deep fakes, but also there's an opportunity with AI um, as well. And you keep mentioning responsibility that we have as professionals, and, and that needs to be a conversation that needs to happen. And we've had a full-blown conversation on ethics, and I know that this is something that should be continued. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you to the attendees as well for um, engaging with us um, this evening and um, have a good evening. Sorry, just one more, one last thing, because my colleagues will just kill me if I didn't <laughs> mention that we have, <laughs> uh, we have a code. Uh, so if you're interested in joining the CIPR, we have a code for uh, for reduced price. So just reach out to me and I will just share the code with you. Thank you, Africa Communications Week 2, for these wonderful sessions. Um, we are really, really grateful to have this platform and opportunity to all come together and discuss. So thank you again and bye. Thank, thank you. you Happy Africa Day. Sharing.